for a couple of years, found out that I hated every second of being a real estate agent. <laughs> but I enjoyed the paperwork aspect of things. And so I got my opportunity. That's awesome. Someone knows. <laughs> I, 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 I got my opportunity when my broker realized that I was on my way out and he decided, you know, there's this new system out right now that we have, that people are starting to use what they call transaction coordinators. He goes, how would you feel about doing that? Your paperwork's usually pretty clean and, and we you know, would like to have somebody nice. and experiment with this. So back then, Transaction coordinators was fairly new. They weren't being used. Every agent did every single item on their own. And when I first started real estate, the MLS was not on the internet. It was a book that you got every single week. So the internet was still in its infancy when I first started real estate. So you guys are really lucky right now because everything is digital and everything you can access from anywhere. Back then, everything, all the paperwork was done on carbon copies. Yeah. You get a copy, client gets a copy, broker gets a copy, title gets a copy. And that's how every file was done on this legal size manila envelope. So if you wanted to file, you couldn't access on your computer. You had to go to the office and pull it out of control. Mm -hmm. So you guys are very lucky. But what I've been able to do over the years has been able to bridge that gap and make things a lot simpler for everybody. So what we're going to go over today is a few items that uh, document training, some items that I've been seeing a lot, a lot of lately, so I wanted to make sure you guys understood what the process is and how things go around, uh, go about and all that stuff. So in here, I'm kind of curious, how many of you, you know, think you got a pretty good grasp on car forms? Okay, I'm gonna ask this question again. <laughs> this is, no. The what I call the Bible of car forms. This has every single document of car. Take a look how thick that is. Now ask and I'll ask again how do you if you guys feel comfortable about car forms? No, no. Okay. Never <laughs> mind. That's what I thought. Even I don't know everything that's in here. But I do know probably about anywhere from ninety to ninety five percent of all these documents that are in here. Even I have to refer to it every now and then. So Never tell someone you are very comfortable with every one of them because I'm not even comfortable with all of them yet. So, I just got this uh, two months ago. Yeah. So, and I was, I took the 12 hour course to get me certified as a documents trainer. So, I'm pretty up to date when it comes to, to most of this stuff. So, first item, you guys all got this uh, handout that I put together, uh, kind of giving you some basic information on um, certain items that have been coming up a lot, trusts, LLCs, uh, uh, exemptions, things like that. So when you're dealing with a trust, there are certain rules that will make a seller exempt from doing certain disclosures. And you have to kind of understand what those rules are. So there's three basic questions that you know you have to ask, and if they answer all of these questions yes, then they are required to provide a TDS and SVQ, and that is essential uh, when doing these. So if they say, oh, no, I'm, I, I shouldn't be doing that. However, if they answer all these yes, they can do it. But if they answer any of these questions no, they are exempt, so they will not have to do the three-page TDS or the four-page SVQ. They just have to do a one-page ESD, which is the exempt seller disclosures. And keep in mind, this document Lucio has created, he's put it into the Roaming Resources folder under Joe's Manager Tools. Yes. It's available for you guys. So we're going to go over those real quickly. The first question is, is it a revocable trust? The second one, is it a live and natural person? And the third one, has the trustee, he or she, either owned the property in their own name or lived in the property within the last year? So if they have not owned the property or have not lived in the property within the last year, that's typically the one thing that usually gets them exempt because they've never lived on the property and they're automatically exempt and they just provide the ESD form and then they can bypass doing the TDS and SVQ. It's a big deal because there's a lot of information you can pull off of the TDS and SVQ. So if they meet that criteria, 
then they are exempt. They don't have to provide those items. And in addition to that, that would mean also uh, the earthquake disclosure. They can mark everything as don't know. And then also uh, another form that I believe that they just said would they would be exempt from would be the FHDS, which is the new fire hardening and, and defensible space disclosure. They would also be exempt from doing that form. Okay. Um, so now, say you get into a process, you find out they have a they have a trust, um, and you're kind of like, well, they're in a trust. What do I do now? Okay, so you have a listing you, or, or a purchase and you figure out that they're gonna be doing it in a trust. Like the first thing you need to do is make sure you get your client to get all those trust documents, a copy of it and get it over to title. Because title needs to review those items. They need to review it and approve it. Because they have to figure out who is on there, who is authorized to sign on behalf of that trust. And typically, that's gonna be one of my first questions is, is in a trust, okay, who's the authorized signer? Because I've had a lot of things signed by the wrong person and we have to get everything re-signed again. So there is a particular person that, is, that will be authorized to sign. Um, and so that is important what you need to do. Um, and then, you know, of course, the most important thing, let me know that's in a trust, because then I can help you. Okay, I'll, I'll make things very simple for you. Next, power of attorneys. A lot of this has been coming up lately. There's been a lot of things where somebody's signing on somebody else's behalf, either that person's out of the country or they're incapacitated and can't sign. And I'll go over those two versions as well. So first thing you wanna do, again, collect the power of attorney, a copy of that. Title's gonna need a copy of it. They need to verify it, make sure it's a valid power of attorney. I've had instances where they turn the power of attorney and it's not even been properly recorded or anything and they do not have power of attorney to sign on behalf of the seller. And then we have to get a special power of attorney through title and get that all taken care of. Another version is a power of attorney due to incapacitation. Now when a client is having health issues and can't sign on their own behalf, you have to do a power of attorney with incapacitation, meaning they need to provide documentation that the uh, client is incapacitated mentally or health, which requires usually at least one or two letters from a doctor saying that they cannot sign on their own behalf anymore. Then you give it to the title company. Then, yeah, give proof of that to the title company as well. Um, and they can, if there's not a power of attorney already set in place, they can provide a special power of attorney due to the, that information that's being provided. In many cases, an attorney would draft that document. Yes, well. yeah, an attorney will draft it, but they will also require copies of those items saying that they're incapacitated. And many times, I will need a copy of the incapacitation form on file as well. So just keep that in mind. Now, power of attorneys, what do you do when you have two clients and one has a power of attorney over the other one on a file. So basically you have two sellers, but one has power of attorney to sign on the other person's behalf. That person has to sign twice, one for themselves and one for the person who is, uh, that they're signing for on power of attorney. Okay. So, that's where some people, some of these clients sometimes will get a little agitated because you're telling them you need to sign this twice. And they're like, well, I'm signing here. Why do I need to do it twice? Well, you have to explain to them. There's two vested interests on this. You have to sign for yourself and you have to sign for the other person. But the signature line would still say their name on it. The signature Correct. line is, is a little tricky. Yeah. So when they're signing on behalf of somebody else, they're actually signing J. Doe by John Doe Attorney, in fact, that's how they sign. Okay. That is how they're supposed to sign when they're doing the power of attorney. That that is their legal signature that that should be showing up on documents. They, I mean, essentially, they could get away with just doing just their name twice. <laughs> However, legally, the proper way is Jane, Jane Doe by John Doe, attorney, in fact. Okay, that's the, that's legally the proper way to do it. And it could fly with one compliance officer, but not with another. And I, I'm pretty good about arguing with the compliance officer, so 
I'll, I'll deal with that battle when it comes to it, but uh, it is, that's important when, when dealing with the power of attorneys there. The, uh, the next one, LLCs or entities. This one gets a little tricky. Okay, say you've got an LLC, Shadow Brook Real, uh, maybe they're calling it Shadow Brook LLC. Okay, a lot of times clients do not understand that they cannot go in and just sign Shadow Brook LLC. Yeah. Okay, they, they will try to fight you on it. Trust me, I've had it happen. They will go and tell you, oh, that's how I've always signed, that's how I'm, that's the way I'm gonna sign, and I will push it back again and tell them, no, you have to sign as an individual. That is why we have forms such as the RCSD in place that authorize them to sign on behalf of an entity. But a lot of times they try and say that they don't have to do that because they don't want their name showing up anywhere. Well, that's not how it works. Okay, they have to sign as an individual representing that LLC. Now, the way that they just sign is they just sign their name. They don't have to sign anything else, just to sign their name. Then we have an RCSD provided that stipulates that they did, there's the authorized sign on that. What happens when you do have an LLC? Same thing, same rules apply. Get a copy of it. There will be documentation that will tell you in there who is authorized to sign on behalf of the LLC. And LLCs are a little different because there could be multiple people that are authorized to sign on it, but in the paperwork it'll also stipulate which one of those people has to sign. It could be one, it could be everyone, but it has the rules stipulated in that LLC. So keep that in mind. You may have say, oh, I'm, 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 doing, I'm authorized to sign on that. Okay, who else is authorized? And who is mandatory to sign? Because you don't have a valid contract if, not, if all the parties haven't signed. So you have to get signatures repeat from everyone who needs time. to sign. Huh? <laughs> Can you repeat that one more time? You do not have a valid contract if all the parties have not signed. And is, is that just on the RS? RS, oh, uh, RS, uh, RS everything. Every single, every single document uh, has to be signed by every party who is a mandatory signer on the behalf of the LLC, on the behalf of the trust, and even on behalf of any type of document where you have multiple sellers. There is a saying that I've heard float around that is incorrect. One signature deems a ratified contract. That is incorrect. So husband, wife, wife is on vacation. You sign a listing agreement with the husband only. It's not. It's not a binding contract. No. Every party with a vested interest has to sign. Okay. Lucio, where do we find out who those parties are? You can always, uh, you, can, you know, beforehand, if you are unsure who can, uh, who is on title, you can ask the title company to pull a free, a free link for you. On there, it'll tell you who's vested on the property, how many people are involved, and every person that shows up on that free link has to sign. That's the simplest way. Other ways, programs such as My First Hand, I use it all the time, uh, which is a free program that the title company offers to you at First American. You can put in a property, uh, property address, it'll pull up a property profile, similar to the realist, and you can pull that information. What I like about my first am is I'm also able to go in and go into the transaction history and pull up the last item recorded against the property. So say there was a, a late grant deed recorded, I can pull that document up and see who it was, who the signers are on it, and who they granted it over to. So, and, and then that person is now the legal sign of the property. So there's, there's tools to use. Um, a lot of times just, I tell people, if you're unsure, you have two sellers sitting in front of you and you are unsure, get both of their signatures. Have them sign. It's easier for us to remove a signature than it is to add a signature. Because everybody thinks, oh, just do an addendum and you're done. No, you have to do an addendum with, and the addendum you have to use is an AOAA, which is an additional, is a, an assignment um, addendum. And you're basically assigning an additional buyer. But in addition to that, you have to have them sign everything else you have on file. So that's why I said it's easier to remove them because you can remove one person with just an addendum. But when you add, they have to do a, a special addendum and then sign everything. So it's more work in the long run that way. Um, all right. 
questions so far? I'm, I kind of feel like I'm going a little quick. Is everybody okay so far? Mm -hmm. All right, feel free to stop me at any point. I got a question for you. Yeah. So AOAA, we yep. just went over. What about the AA? The AAA? Yeah. That's an additional uh, additional agent uh, acknowledgement. And the AAA is basically saying you have more than one agent representing your client on that particular transaction. So if Evan and I want to team up on a deal and I, maybe I signed it up, but I, I need his help because I'm too busy. You do, the, all you have to do is an, AO, an AAA that authorizes that agent to represent on behalf of your client as well. They don't need to sign anything else, but they give them the authorization to talk to your client and, and help facilitate the transaction as well. So you can have an, an, AO, an AAA, you can add multiple agents on there. So you can have a bunch of people on there. I was always confused about that. Is that always required, even if both agents are on, uh, either on, like, on the listing or the purchase agreement? If, if they're already on the, yeah, it's always required. It's always required. It's always required. If you have more than one agent, even if it's on the listing agreement or on the purchase agreement, you have more than one agent, you still need an AAA to accompany the, that documentation. Okay, that's always required. Um, all right, so next items. I was going to jump into is what we've been seeing a lot of recently is off market sales. Typically, like for sale by owners. So you approach somebody who you know is a for sale by owner and you're telling them, hey, I've got a buyer who's interested in your property. Would you be willing to, to sell it? Uh, and with me representing them, uh, at, you know, if I bring them to you, what an offer. And they'll, they'll like, sure. Would you be willing to pay a commission? And a lot of times, most of the time, they're like, well, if you bring me a buyer, I'll pay you a commission. Well, the issue with that is you don't have a listing agreement. So you have nothing in writing stating what the commission is going to be. That is where you, this form, the single party compensation comes into effect. This will stipulate what commission they are paying you and it will stipulate who your buyer is, and it's basically only in effect for that one particular buyer. So if that escrow were to fall out of place, there is no binding listing agreement. Okay, you, it'll just work for that. And you don't need to do a listing agreement either. So essentially what it does is it makes you do, you make, turns you into a dual agent representing both sides for the seller and the buyer and it also stipulates what your commission is going to be for that particular buyer. And if that transaction were to cancel or, or be invalid, there's no listing agreement, nothing's being held to the buyer. Yeah. So what if you have a situation where um, they have a signed listing agreement, but it's not on the MLS yet, and you're trying to do a preemptive offer? That's, that, that's basically just a listing. It, it's, a, it's a listing, it's an off-market list. It, it's Are a, you still using this? No, 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 because you have a listing agreement that has, it stipulates what the, the amount But it's are. not on the MLS, so you don't really know what the commission so, is. It, um, you do what's called a CBC. Uh, 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 I always forget what the, 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 the cooperating broker compensation form. There you go. Okay. So a CBC, it, so if you sell a property that's not in the MLS, that form is a requirement. You need to get the CPC done, which will stipulate what the commission is going to be being paid to the buyer's agent. Okay, that will put in there, say it's 2.5. That will put it in there, and it also it will state in there, property is not in the MLS, so there's no record of what that is, but that form solves that issue. Okay? It's going to be for your first year and not under. <laughs> Always get it signed first. Uh, you know. Make sure you get a CBC done with the agent before you do the purchase agreement uh, with them because you want to stipulate that you're getting paid. <laughs> um, however, you know I've seen it where the CBC gets done after it's already in escrow and stuff because the agents forgot to do one, and then I just get it taken care of. It, it, but to be safe, get one done when you're doing the purchase agreement. Um, so that form is. There's really not much to go over the single party compensation. It's pretty simple. If you just read it, you just plug in the numbers and the your buyer's information, and it's 
pretty self-explanatory. So it's really not that difficult to do one. It's just most agents don't realize they need one when they do working on it for, for sale by owner. Another form that could also be used when dealing with an off-market transaction, um, say they, the, uh, you go to the seller and you say, hey, I've got a client who would like to buy the property, would you be willing to do it? And they, uh, and they say, I'll sell it, but I'm not paying a commission. Well, you, and then you talk to your buyer who really wants the property and they say, well, I'll pay your commission. You can have your buyer pay the commission and the seller's not paying one by simply doing a commission agreement form. And your buyer could pay you the commission. Okay? And by just filling out in there the information and how much, either a percentage or, or uh, an amount, you can put on there what they are going to pay you to help them buy the property. And so you could essentially charge the buyer the commission. Okay? And that's where this form comes in, into play. And it is a simple form, just like a single party compensation to be filled out. And of course, if that were to happen, you would have to use both of these forms. The single party compensation stating that the seller is not going to pay you a commission and it's gonna be zero. And then you use a commission agreement stating that the buyer is going to pay you the commission instead. Okay, questions on that? These can't accompany a listing agreement. No, this is for transactions or for sale by owners that you do not have a listing agreement. Nothing to sign. Because on the listing agreement, it clearly states exactly how much everyone's getting compensated. For yeah, commission. Exactly. If, if so. you have a FISBO, there's no listing. So this would be like this is making sure owner. that yeah. they get paid, basically. Like, like for sale by owners mm -hmm. who you don't have a listing agreement with. That's where you would use Or some door knocker guy. And the funny part is, I've seen a lot of these happening now. I've seen a lot of single party compensations going on with a lot of, of for sale by owners who are not, don't have a real estate agent or a listing agreement but the agents are approaching them with buyers and then doing going this route. So there's no listing agreement involved. Would you would you say for us it's always gonna be no representation because on the on single party compensation you have you have you have the option to either represent buyer or just seller? I would just put it basically what's gonna happen is we're going to basically be doing the dual compensation anyways. Yeah. Because we have to facil facilitate all the disclosures. Just because they're for sale by owner doesn't doesn't mean that the, the documentation is not required. Yeah. It's still required. So we're essentially doing a dual dual agency. Yeah. So if, you're just better off just putting dual agency. You're representing them uh, as well for this particular buyer. Yeah. And then uh, and, uh, and of course you get credit for two. Yeah. In in my numbers, yeah. you get credit for two when you when escrow closes. So <laughs> and and trust me, you like having your numbers with me. <laughs> with the extra number on there. Then if you bring a buyer or a seller and they're like, oh yeah, you can bring anybody if you want to, mm -hmm. then you would prefer a city to a listing agreement and just keep it on working. If, if they're willing to sign a listing agreement, uh -huh. by all means get a listing we'll agreement. That. Because then what will happen is if you bring that buyer and something were to happen and it doesn't work out, and you're like, oh, you still have the listing to sell to somebody else. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you if you could talk them into signing yeah. with you on a listing agreement, more power to you. But if they don't want to deal with you, if that transaction were to fall through, yeah. then a single party compensation is the route to go. Yeah. Because then if that buyer doesn't end up buying, yeah. it's just a one -off. they're not tied to you, it's a one-off. Yeah. Okay, did I answer your question? I was just curious why, well, no, no, go ahead. Good. I was just curious why on the RPA the seller has to, why you couldn't do a listing agreement and promise that you would bring a buyer and that the buyer would pay in this market. Uh, you could. Okay. Not recommended. <laughs> just, that was my question. You'll never sell the property that way. Okay. <laughs> uh, because buyers, buyers out there really know that they, um, that the seller pays the commission and and if you put it into a listing agreement that the buyer's gonna be paying the commission, buyers won't even look at your property. It's, 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 it's common. And it could snag the lender, I would imagine. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, 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 it will it definitely be, unless you get lender approval that the, that the buyer can pay the commission, it will really so, screw up your whole transaction. Yeah, but I have a buyer for the model, model, model. Yeah. Typically, those will work if it's a cash transaction. Yeah. Yeah. So lenders will red flag that really quickly. We're good now? Well, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> I know, I know. You're playing devil's advocate. I, I get it. Yeah, that, that is very unusual, very uncommon. It does not happen. I have seen it before, and the property would sit on the market forever. So, um, all right. So the other form that we printed out to kind of go over RCSD forms. If you're not familiar with these, this is the form that we use when um, establishing a representation on those different items that we went over: uh, trusts, LLCs, power of attorneys. This is the form that you have to use on those. And you basically just mark the box and put in the information. Again, not super difficult to, to, to fill out. If you do have an issue filling one of these out, feel free to reach out to me and I can guide, guide you in the right direction. Um, here's, here's the other cool thing. The new RPA um, put section into it that as long as you fill it out properly on the RPA, this form isn't required. You can actually just do it on the RPA and it eliminates the RCSD altogether. Now, the trick is though, you can put in the information, but if you forget to mark the box on the RPA, there's a little box that says it. If you forget to mark that box, then you'll have to do an RCSD. Yeah? There's a one property that's in Two separate trusts. Then you, you need, need two separate ones of these, right? Okay. Yeah. So, what's that? Good oh, question. Yeah, yeah. It, every trust has to be identified, uh, and, and then a representation has to be filled out for every single trust. And and so all the trust documents for both of the trusts or whatever many trusts you have has to be uh, sent over to title for them to verify as well. Now, I've. Within the last year, there was one transaction where there was eight sellers on one property. That was a rough transaction. You remember that one? <laughs> Just trying to get signatures from everyone was like pulling teeth. It, it, it was. I think it, like half of them were out of state as well. Yeah, out of, out of, out of the country. Yeah. They were in it's South America. Uh, it was not an easy transaction, but in order, like I said earlier, you do not have a ratified contract unless every single party is signed. That one gave us nightmares. Um, I literally blocked out. Disclosures, disclosures alone was a logistic nightmare, but sale-wise as well, they had to sign title documentation as well, every single one of them. <laughs> So it is not the easiest transaction. So always remember, it, every single vested interest has to sign. I cannot stress that enough. Now, so the purpose of this was just to do, to train everyone so that they kind of get a, a, an idea on documents, train of documents, various documents that are called. Uh, you know, it's just a small sample of what is out there. So if you do run across a special situation or circumstance, reach out to me. Uh, you know, I'll give you the answer. It's better, it's better to ask and do it right the first time than it is to go back and try to correct it. So I'm always willing to help out on that. And Evan is a great resource. Joe, if you can, you know, you can always give him a call. Uh, and if he doesn't know the answer, you can, you can reach out to me when I'm available as well. But there are people in place. Geneva, she's been the protege of disclosures. <laughs> so she has gotten very good at answering disclosure questions. So she can always help out there. Um, and I don't have children, but I do have a life. So if you want to suffer, <laughs> before night. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Did you say that? 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 Did you say